Hi guys, episode 32, I think. Groovy. Get it? Hey, come closer. Oh, that's better. Okay, stormy 60s, 1960. I was born in 62. Somebody murdered me in 1962. Man, that's a messed up mess. Okay. The election of JFK, the famous first presidential debates, which just happened to be broadcast on TV. Republicans chose uh, Nixon as their candidate, and he was viewed as a gifted party leader by some and a ruthless opportunist by others. Um, again, they think that he's ruthless because of his performance during the McCarthy trials and the second Red Scare. He was very, very, very rabid anti-communist uh, on the side of McCarthy. Uh, Helen Gagan Douglas has cast communist-leaning votes, and she is pink right down to her underwear. Pink and pinko reds. The Democrats nominated John F. Kennedy with LBJ as his running mate. In the famous debate. 70 million Americans watched the first ever presidential debate, which is more people than voted. That's a problem. Um, that is also because there's not really very many channels. People don't have any options, and it was on every channel. Nixon had rehearsed extensively and appeared defensive and unnaturally at ease. However, he had just been released from the hospital, and the sweat reflected the light into the camera, making him look weak and pale. Kennedy looked healthy, tan, confident, and like a natural-born leader. And, of course, he's good-looking, and as some of you know, that matters about how people feel about you. Uh, JFK challenged Nixon to four debates, the first ever nationally televised. JFK held his own issue on issues, but he looked more charismatic, healthier, and handsome than Nixon. Clearly. Kennedy was attacked as a Catholic. He was the first and only Catholic president in U.S. history. I am not the Catholic candidate for president. I am the Democratic Party's candidate for president, who happens also to be a Catholic. <clears throat> look. Bro, what? It doesn't look like a BB gun or a fake gun when we were little kids. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. I don't know what the circles are all about. Maybe they're all looking at him like, is that kid going to shoot himself in the head? What are you doing? Don't. Put that down. Kenny, he was a handsome lad. Look at him. No wonder I slept with him. Look at him. He lost some southern votes, but northern Catholics came out in droves for him. Huh? This guy is obsessed with me. The guy who made the PowerPoints is obsessed with Marilyn Monroe. And it was very close. JFK's victory largely surprised the nation. He only won the popular vote by 0.1%. This is his official White House portrait. He was known as Jack. Uh, JFK believed that sex was the only thing that made his chronic headaches go away. That's not true. That's not true. Hey, I made it go the wrong way. Oops. That's not true. Don't think about that. Uh, he had affairs with many young women from actresses, secretaries, to prostitutes. Jack. His name was Jack Kennedy. He didn't go by John. JFK was the youngest president ever, elected at 43 years, 236 days, but not the youngest president ever. First president, youngest president ever elected. Teddy was the youngest ever at 43 years, 322 days. That's supposed to be 42. It's supposed to be 42. I made a mistake. It's 42. JFK delivered a stirring inauguration address and assembled a very young cabinet. Ask not what, you can, what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Kennedy's people may be every bit as intelligent as you say, 
but I'd feel a whole lot better about them if just one of them had run for sheriff once. There they are. This is Bobby Kennedy, who's also going to be assassinated in 1968, and Teddy Kennedy, and, um, come on, Renee. Uh, this Kennedy was in Senate for forever, and he got in an accident in Chappaquiddick, and it's famously his date. Uh, they drove into, off a bridge and into a river or something, and he made it out of the car, and she didn't, Mary Jo Kopechny. And he survived, and she didn't, and then he walked all the way home. Uh, Edward Kennedy. Edward. Ted. Teddy Kennedy. Teddy Kennedy. Um, and he, therefore, he never, ever had a shot at being president because of this uh, Chappaquiddick hanging over top of him, that this girl died, and he didn't go in and save her or try to save her, and he walked away from the scene of the crime and didn't show up till later, which means that everybody thought he was drunk and that he drove into the water by accident, but as a result was the reason she died. Teddy Kennedy. Uh, JFK appointed his brother Robert Kennedy as his attorney general. And then business whiz McNamara took over the Department of Defense. He's the one almost single-handedly responsible for the, uh, uh, the increase in troops in Vietnam. And there's little John John Kennedy. JFK's domestic plan was called the New Frontier, and his goal was to eradicate poverty. So on the domestic front, that's what he called it, the New Frontier. Remember that we've had the square deal, the new deal, the fair deal with Truman, and now we have the New Frontier, John F. Kennedy's domestic plan. Um, LBJ's is going to be called the Great Society, and it's still one of the most significant plans that exists today, LBJ's Great Society, because it's a lot of civil rights. This is what the cities were left to. Everybody moved to the suburbs, and all of the funding and all of the money that had been initially put into cities was then taken out, and it was absolutely disgusting and horrible and left to drugs and poverty and crime, and nobody did anything about it. New Frontier helped the unemployed, introduced food stamps, and created several other social programs to combat poverty. We stand today on the edge of a new frontier. The frontier of the 1960s, a frontier of unknown opportunities and perils, a frontier of unfulfilled hopes and threats. The new frontier of which I speak is not a set of promises, it is a set of challenges. JFK. Uh, the, the new frontier lacked the complete congressional support that FDR's New Deal enjoyed. He did not have either the House or the Senate, I don't know which, probably the Senate. And of course, the moon, JFK pushed for a moon landing. Many Americans ridiculed this idea. We choose to go to the moon in this decade, he says decade, uh, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are willing to postpone, we, one we are will, unwilling to postpone, and one which we intended to win, 1962 JFK. Um, and of course, we are going to get to the moon, but he does not get to see it. Cold War rumblings in Europe. JFK proposed the Peace Corps, an army of idealist young volunteers to bring American skills to underdeveloped nations. Uh, now old people go to the Peace Corps after they retire. I might go to the Peace Corps. I'm thinking about it. And go help in other countries. Khrushchev tried to threaten JFK when they met, but JFK was not intimidated. I know for certain that Kennedy doesn't have a strong background, nor generally speaking does he have the courage to stand up to a serious challenge. He's going to find out that's not true in the Cuban Missile Crisis. 13 days in October of 1962. In August 61, Soviets began building the Berlin Wall to separate East and West Berlin. 1961 to 1989. Famously, Reagan says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Doesn't happen until H.W. Bush is president, but nonetheless. The Berlin Wall. And then, famously, Kennedy goes to Germany. JFK spoke in Berlin, promising Germans we would protect them against Soviet aggression. Uh, 2,000 years ago, the proudest boast was civis Romanus sum. I am a Roman citizen. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is ich bin ein Berliner. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin, and therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, 
Ich bin ein Berliner. Presumably he said, I am a jelly donut. I don't know. I don't know what he said. In the 1960s, Western Europe was prospering again thanks to the very successful Marshall Plan funds. George C. Marshall, the Marshall Plan, everybody's rebuilding. We are creating a lot of uh, machinery and industry to help the people in Europe. That's helping us as well. We're making a lot of money. We're selling a lot of things, and our economy improves a lot as a result, too. Robert McNamara uh, adopted the flexible response policy, an array of military options that he felt could help solve a variety of problems that arose. So that if we need to use tanks, we'll use tanks. If we need to use bombs, then we'll use bombs. If we need to use rockets, then we'll use rockets. Uh, it was called flexible response because depending on what was happening, they could use a variety of different military or diplomatic options. Thus, flexible response. And then Vietnam. As we said, in uh, 1961, when Kennedy took office, uh, 1,000 people were in Vietnam. But by the time that he left, uh, would, died, uh, assassinated in 1963, 3,000 people were in Vietnam. Some people uh, believe he was going to try to take us out of Vietnam, and that angered people that were part of the military industrial complex that wanted us to go to war to make lots and lots and lots of money making lots and lots and lots of weapons. I don't know. I haven't studied it enough to know. In 1918, in 1918, Ho Chi Minh from Vietnam tried to encourage Woodrow Wilson to help liberate the Vietnamese from French control at Versailles and to have self-determination, one of his 14 points. Uh, Ho Chi Minh wanted to have a democracy. He wanted to have their own country. There wasn't even communism yet. We didn't even have communism yet. And we could have helped them then, but we didn't. We didn't help them. And as a result, we have to fight a war there that kills a lot of Americans. Japan took control of Vietnam in World War II, and then the French tried to recolonize the region after the war. The French got kicked out by the Japanese, and then they came back. And the Indochina War is from 1946 to 1954, when the French finally gave up and left Vietnam. And then we go into Vietnam because we don't want to have uh, Ho Chi Minh turn the country into a communist nation and have the domino theory happen, where this nation becomes communist, then that nation, then that nation, and that nation, and so on. So Ho Chi Minh, now a communist due to Chinese support, because they did help him, gained control of northern Vietnam and fought independence from the French colonizers in the south, 1946 to 1954 fighting against the French. In 1954, the French were finally driven from Vietnam. The country was split at the 17th parallel between the communist North Vietnamese and the democratic South Vietnamese. Ho Chi Minh wanted all of it, though. He wanted all of Vietnam. However, the US-backed South Vietnam's Ngo Dinh Diem, despite his obvious corruption, simply because he was not a communist, but he was incredibly corrupt and a terrible leader and we do help assassinate him. South Vietnam was threatened by the communist Viet Minh movement led by Ho Chi Minh. That's American sailors. Ho Chi Minh Trail. This is what I was telling you about, is that Ho Chi Minh Trail is in Laos and Cambodia, and all of these communists go on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and the Viet Cong come down here into, into South Vietnam and are able to come, but we aren't allowed to go into Laos or Cambodia, which was what Nixon's problem was, and why he attacks Cambodia, because this all used to be Indochina. This used to be the French Indochina. So they're used to working together against the French, but now we're only allowed to be in Vietnam, so everybody that is uh, North Vietnam Army, the Viet Minh, and the Viet Cong, all are fighting against South Vietnam. The Viet Minh helped, out, helped the Viet Cong of the South who supported communism and the overthrow of Diem. JFK slowly escalated troop levels in the region to maintain order, but they were not to be put in harm's way. Oh, they were put in harm's way. They weren't supposed to be, but they were. And then crisis in Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis. That's Fidel Castro. Latin America resented the U.S. sending Europe billions of dollars, but only millions to them. The U.S. did not foresee communism spreading into our hemisphere, so we didn't help very much in the South. So then the communists went into the South, 
and started helping those places. And so a lot of them became communist because we didn't think ahead to help Latin American countries. U.S. continued to intervene in Latin American affairs, though. Guatemala in 1954, building tensions. We went in and still participated in places just because there were communist efforts there. Operations uh, PB success was a CIA-led coup in Guatemala that overthrew the communist leading Jacob Arbenz in the aftermath of the coup. The Guatemalans endured a 36-year <coughs> civil war and genocide. Guatemala's Mayan population was wiped out due to their communist tendencies, and even today they're trying to escape to the United States of America. On our southern border, Guatemala has never been the same since. Since we got involved. In 1959, Fidel Castro overthrew the Cuban leader, the U.S. puppet, Fulgencio Batista. The Platt Amendment was used often to keep the brutal Batista in power. Batista was the puppet that we put in Cuba, and so he did whatever we wanted, even though he was a cruel dictator. The corruption of the government, the brutality of the police, the regime's indifference to the needs of the people for education, medical care, housing for social justice, and economic justice is an open invitation to revolution. Arthur Schlesinger is saying that it's impossible that there wouldn't have been a revolution, that he didn't care about anybody in his country. So Castro's popularity was based on denouncing Yankee imperialism and influence, especially from the Platt Amendment that said that we can get involved in Cuban affairs, which we should not have been able to because that is sort of a colonial power. At, uh, at the beginning of 1959, the U.S. companies owned about 40% of Cuban sugar lands, almost all the cattle ranches, 90% of the mines and mineral concessions, 80% of the utilities, practically all of the oil industry, and supplied two-thirds of Cuba's imports. We were highly tied into Batista's government. Castro threw, overthrew that to get us out. He overthrew Cuba to get us out of Cuba. We had colonized them economically. Clearly, we had taken over a lot of their economy. This is Che Guevara. Che Guevara. Castro was seen as a hero when he took over the U.S. properties in Cuba and gave redist and redistributed them back to the Cuban people. So he took over a lot of the properties owned by the very wealthy, 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 most of them who fled to Cuba, I mean to Miami, and then Che Guevara, he and Che Guevara took the country over. Che Guevara was assassinated in 1965 in, 65 in Bolivia by the CIA because he helped with communist overthrows, uh, helped communists overthrow leaders that were tied to the United States of America. In 1961, the U.S. ended diplomatic relations with Cuba and cut off the purchase of Cuban sugar because we no longer controlled it. Khrushchev threatened a missile launch if the U.S. invaded Cuba because now Castro and Khrushchev were now allies. The U.S. forced the Organization of American States to condemn communism in the Americas. We forced them to do that. They didn't have a choice. Ike proposed a Marshall Plan for Latin America worth $500 million, but it was too little too late. Had they done that right from Jump Street, uh, back with Truman, we probably would have had a very united uh, Americas, Americas in general. JFK's Alliance for Progress provided financial assistance to Latin Americans. He hoped to help poor people and deny, to deny communism. So Alliance for Progress. It was very slow in getting the money to them. It didn't help. In 1961, JFK authorized a CIA planned invasion of Cuba by Cuban refugees. It was called the Bay of Pigs, Bahia de Cochinos. Cochinos is pigs, Bay of Pigs. That's why it's called the Bay of Pigs. We helped Cuban refugees to go back and invade, and then we left them there to, to die or to be arrested. It didn't go well. On April 17, 1961, the Bay of Pigs invasion was a disaster. JFK sent no air support to help the rebels. Guess what? 
it turns out the air support was an hour late because somebody did not understand the time change. And so because it was an hour earlier in Cuba than it was here, we literally were an hour late and all of those people were screwed, caught, some of them killed, many imprisoned. Because of a time change error. This failed attempt on Castro's regime and life further cemented Cuba's ties to the Soviet Union. In 1962, a U.S. spy plane spotted missile installations in Cuba. They were Soviet nukes aimed at the United States of America. By the way, we had nukes in Turkey aimed at, at Soviet Union, but nobody's told about that during this entire escapade. The Cuban Missile Crisis lasted 13 nerve-wracking days. The U.S. and Soviet Union were on the brink of nuclear war. Diplomacy used diplomatic pressure to get the Soviet Union to remove the missiles. Warning, send a message to Castro to warn him of the grave danger he and Cuba were in. Three, blockade, use the U.S. Navy to block any missiles from arriving in Cuba. Four, airstrike, use the U.S. Air Force to attack all known missile sites. Five, full force invasion of Cuba and overthrow of Castro. These are all our options. These are all options. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba from whatever nation or port will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. We are not at this time, however, denying the necessities of life as the Soviets attempted to do in their Berlin blockade of 1948. It's making a clear distinction between the two. Quarantine interdiction line. This blockade of navigation in international waters and airspace constituted an act of aggression, propelling humankind into the abyss of a world nuclear missile war. Khrushchev. After a USA blockade of Cuba, Khrushchev finally agreed to pull missiles out of Cuba, and that's when they say that Khrushchev blinked, as in a staring contest, and he blinked first. And as a result, there's no nuclear war. There could have been nuclear war otherwise. The U.S. vowed never to invade Cuba again and secretly agreed to remove nukes in Turkey. It has to say secretly. It should say secretly, Renee. They secretly removed nu nukes from Turkey. We don't say that publicly, nor will we allow Khrushchev to say that publicly. If he does, we won't remove the nukes. And then we have a phone that is now connected directly to the Kremlin in the Soviet Union. A direct hotline was established between Moscow and Washington, D.C. in case of any future crisis so they could avert it. Mr. President, we and you ought not pull on the ends of the rope in which you have tied the knot of war, because the more the two of us pull, the tighter that knot will be tied. You yourself understand perfectly of what terrible forces our countries dispose. Consequently, if there is no intention to tighten that knot and thereby to doom the world to the catastrophe of thermonuclear war, then let us not only relax the forces pulling on the ends of the rope, let us take measures to untie that knot. We are ready for this. Khrushchev. In June of 63, JFK spoke of better relations with the Soviets, beginning a policy of detente and an easing of tensions. An easing of tensions in 1963, only months before he's assassinated. It's going to go the opposite direction after he dies when LBJ comes into office. There will not be detente, and there's detente with Nixon, but there could have been detente, which means an easing of tensions with JFK had he not been assassinated. And that, now the struggle for civil rights. In 1960, the election of JFK appealed to black voters by promising civil rights reforms. As President JFK seemed slow or unwilling to make these reforms consumed by foreign policy events, so the foreign policy with him and with LBJ supersedes domestic affairs, and as a result, uh, the civil rights progress is put on a back burner because of foreign affairs and the Cold War. <clears throat> In the 1960s, freedom riders rode buses through the Deep South protesting segregation 
white and black riders faced violent white mobs when they arrived in the Deep South. They were going into waiting rooms that had been segregated, but by law were not allowed to be segregated. So white and black people rode these buses and then went and integrated those waiting rooms at the bus station like the law said they were allowed to do, and they were beat, and you saw one was even firebombed. JFK encouraged SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the Voter Education Project that registered Southern African Americans. He wanted them to continue to do that. Some places desegregated easily, but others resisted the Deep South. Some places desegregated. It's sad. James Meredith tried to enroll at the University of Mississippi, but white students stopped him. James Meredith. He finally does get in to the University of Mississippi. So JFK sent 400 federal marshals and 3,000 troops to ensure his enrollment into the University of Mississippi. I was engaged in a war, and my objective was to force the federal government, the Kennedy administ administration at that time, into a position where they would have to use the United States military force to enforce my rights as a U.S. citizen. James Meredith. In the spring of 63, MLK launched a peaceful campaign versus discrimination in Birmingham, Alabama. Think Bull Connor, fire hoses, dogs. Bull Connor. Birmingham police, uh, under the direction of Bull Connor, responded viciously to protesters who demanded reform as the American public watched on TV and as you saw as the whole world watched in horror. Remember, a lot of these kids were from 6 to 16 years of age. On June 11th of 63, JFK gave a speech urging immediate action towards this immoral issue. I don't know if you've been bitten by a dog before, but it hurts. I was bitten as a little kid a couple times, and then as an adult, I was bitten. It hurts. Violence continued throughout the summer of 1963. It was a very violent summer in the Deep South. And then August, August 28, 1963, MLK Jr. delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech in the March on Washington. Uh, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, free at last. So it was momentous, incredible, famous, amazing event. And still remembered today. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at a table of brotherhood. And then awful... September 63, a bomb exploded in a Birmingham church, killing four young black girls that were in the basement. <clears throat> One of them was the best friend of Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza Rice was the Secretary of State of George W. Bush. And then Kennedy. The grassy knoll. November 22nd, 1963, JFK was shot and killed in Dallas, Texas. That's his brain. This is the grassy knoll. This is the grassy knoll. Lee Harvey Oswald was the alleged assassin. We don't really get to know a lot about it because then somebody kills him. Jack Ruby kills him shortly after he killed JFK. He presumably killed JF <clears throat> JFK. Uh, someday I'm going to find the time to be able to read about all of this. Uh, supposedly there's this magic bullet, famously one bullet, goes through Kennedy's head and then also through Connolly in three different places, who's a senator sitting in front of him. Oswald, who insisted he was innocent, was shot and killed by Jack Ruby. So we don't get to know what he believed or thought or said. The truth of what Lee Har Harvey Oswald was going to say. 
Much controversy, scandal, and conspiracy ensued over the assassination. And LBJ was uh, sworn in on a flight uh, with Jackie, uh, JFK's wife. Lyndon Baines Johnson became president, LBJ. This is that famous uh, painting in the White House of JFK. Shaking hands with a young Bill Clinton, JFK's legacy legend grew after his death. There's Bill Clinton as a young man shaking hands with JFK. And this is crazy. This is so cool. The curious case of Lincoln and Kennedy. Watch this. This is crazy. Abraham Lincoln was elected to Congress in 1846. John F. Kennedy was elected to Congress in 1946. Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860. John F. Kennedy was elected president in 1960. The names Lincoln and Kennedy each contain seven letters. Both were particularly concerned with civil rights of African Americans. Both wives lost a child while living in the White House. Both presidents were shot on a Friday. Both presidents were shot in the head. Lincoln's secretary was named Kennedy. Kennedy's secretary was named Lincoln. Both were assassinated by Southerners. Both were succeeded by Southerners named Johnson. Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Lincoln, was born in 1808. Lyndon Johnson, who succeeded Kennedy, was born in 1908. Come on. Isn't this nuts? John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated Lincoln, was born in 1839. Lee Harvey Oswald, who assassinated Kennedy, was born in 1939. Both assassins were known by their three names. Both names are composed of 15 letters. Kennedy was shot in a car called Lincoln. Booth ran from the theater and was caught in a warehouse. Oswald ran from a warehouse and was caught in a theater. Booth and Oswald were assassinated before their trials. A week before Lincoln was shot, he was in Monroe, Maryland, a week before Kennedy was shot, he was with Marilyn Monroe. What? Deuces. Have a good day.